Hi, my name is Linda Dunyara Bays. My class on Skillshare just launched, and it's all about how to integrate AI into your art practice. Guess what? Today, I'm sharing an exclusive sneak peek with you. Stay tuned. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at how AI produces images and why that's very different in terms of mechanics for how we produce images. While we're going to be focusing on diffusion models, I'm going to start with an introduction of different models and how they generally work. We'll also get to talk about data sets and why they're important for image production in AI. We're going to be using Midjourney to create images with AI. There are other equivalents out there. You could use Gemini, you could use ChatGPT, you could use Stable Diffusion. They usually all do the same thing. One important aspect of how diffusion models create images is something called denoising. And to show you how that works, I'm going to open Midjourney and I'm going to prompt for a cat. Very simple, right? So I'm going to prompt for a cat in a tree. And then you'll see that the model starts to do something that is denoising. As you'll see here, the model starts from an image that's completely random pixels. And then gradually, as it goes from 80% to 90% to 100%, it becomes a cat. And this is really important to know about how AI makes images, because as we'll see, this is a result of how AI learns. The AI started with a random noise and gradually turned that into a real image. And that's not by accident. So the way diffusion models actually learn is by being given images and learning how to add noise into the image until the image is invisible anymore. So that's called forward process. So they do that over and over again. And once they've mastered the ability to add noise and increase the noise of an image, they then learn the reverse process, which is to decrease the noise of an image in order to create uh, the image in the first place. Not all AI works the same. In the example we've just been through, we looked at a diffusion model and we looked at the denoising process. But you've probably used ChatGPT before, which is a large language model, or LLM for short. Or you've used uh, a model that helped you train a LoRa before. Or maybe you've trained the GAN. These are all different kinds of AI models that work differently. For instance, a GAN is very different than a diffusion model in that you have to provide the data set to train the GAN. But when you prompt a diffusion model using Midjourney, like what we did today, you don't have to necessarily bring in your own data sets. Because they work differently, and they work differently than humans, AI cannot be a substitute for creativity necessarily. But if you bring it into your process, and you're aware of the different strengths that different models have, then it can inform a pretty interesting practice. All these models work differently. They're very different from how we create images. AI starts with noise. It starts with a random image. And then it gradually refines that image to create what we've asked for. That's very different from how a human makes an image because we start with intentionality. And that is a fundamental difference between human versus AI-made images. The way we learn is very different. AI learns in a very procedural way. As humans, we learn from experience. We learn from examples. Sometimes we even learn from osmosis, like just being around something helps you learn it. For example, can you recall how you learned how to speak? With an LLM, uh, like ChatGPT, we could probably write down exactly the steps that it used to learn how to say stuff. Another fundamental difference between how AI makes and how we make is that we usually come with context. We come with a culture and certain practices that inform the way we work or the way we create. But AI usually only has a training data to rely on. It will make predictions and find patterns within that training data in order to create something new. It doesn't necessarily come with a context or a particular cultural lens um, that isn't present within the data set. Despite the fact that there are different kinds of AI models that all work differently, one thing that's important to all of them is the data they're trained on. And this data or these data sets are millions and millions of images that are collected and gathered and labeled in order to train the AI model. It's very important to interrogate the data sets that are used to train AI because there's no data set that's neutral. A lot of the data sets that we have right now are directly taken from what we've put out on the internet. 
And as we know, the internet penetration is not the same everywhere in the world. So some cultures might be more represented than other cultures. And this is evident when you start to interrogate an AI. For example, biases in a data set can be very obvious, like when you're generating a face. And if you just ask for a face and don't necessarily give the context, the AI might give you more likely than not a Caucasian face versus a black and brown face. Or it can be a stylistic and very subtle uh, bias. For instance, always having words in AI images written in Roman characters as opposed to other languages. In the previous lesson, I had made a, a few images reflecting on home and trying to hang on to it. Let's look at them here. I'm going to use one of these images as a reference uh, in order to illustrate this next step. So let's say this one that says, I tried to hang on, but home was gone. So I'm going to take that, which is kind of channeling this idea of creating based on nostalgia or using nostalgia as a fuel. And then I'm going to pop it over into mid-journey. It would be interesting to find out how differently AI would conceive of the sentence that's on this artwork. I tried to hang on to home, but home was lost. So now that we've seen what the AI has created, there are four images that I don't particularly think respond to the prompt. It's probably looked at or thought about home as a physical object, like in this image where the house is flying away, um, or I'm not really sure what this uh, image does, but it's someone climbing a tree. And then uh, there's a sort of an old house, that's an, a decaying house, which is a little bit more poetic than the other ones. When I was thinking about this prompt, and this we've seen in, in the first lesson, I made something that looked like this, very abstract, uh, but to me feels very connected to the idea I was channeling. And so what we see here is that AI doesn't respond in the same way to something as abstract as this, this sentiment or this sentence or this goal. It needs instruction. It needs to actually know what you want it to create. So if I wanted to create with AI something that looked like the images that I made, I would have had a very different prompt. It's not able to process things the same way we are. And this is why in this exercise, you're going to get to do this again at home and compare the two images and feel free to play around with different prompts. They don't have to be perfect prompts. That's the point. Uh, they just have to be things that are usually enough for you to start creating. As you compare to the images, think about these two questions. How does the process of creating an image with AI using any of the prompts that you use differ from the way you create? And did you find anything surprising? For example, when I tried this, one of the images included a cat, probably because the previous image I prompted was of a cat. Thanks for joining me in this lesson. This is part of my class with Skillshare, exploring how to make art using AI. Join me in the full class, where we'll make a zine that spells out our manifesto for how to integrate AI into our practice. Click on the link below. I can't wait to see you there. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe to stay up to date on all of our latest videos.